Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I am one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. How you doing, Jay? Great, Michael. Good to be back. We took last week off. Yes, we did. It's I, summertime. It's summertime. I was, I was uh, up in Minnesota spending some time with the family, but uh, we're back. Yeah. We're back. So we got a nice. special guest welcome with back. us. We got a special guest yes, with us. Yes, we do. Week. Yeah, we've got uh, um, Ali Shakari, and he works with a company called Tone Den, who I uh, I'd kind of heard some things about, and then recently he'd reached out to uh, one of my clients, and I reached out to Ali and or Ali and um, had a, a good conversation, and he sent me a deck, and uh, I did kind of the due diligence and checked with a couple of a uh, couple of my clients that had worked with him, and they had some really good things to say, and as I kind of uh, you know, did a little research. I found it really, really fascinating. So I thought it would be great to have him on, talk through some of the things that he's doing because I think it's a little bit different than uh, what uh, a lot of folks in the space are doing. And uh, I'm excited to work with him. Um, Ali, welcome to the show, man. Welcome. Yeah, thank, thanks, Jay. Thanks, Mike, for having me on board. Uh, for as, as far as context for everyone, uh, I, I run a company called Tone Den with, with two of my best friends. We essentially help artists and labels not only find their most engaged fans, but ultimately convert them into sales, whether it's streams, merch, merch purchases, ticket purchases, we do our best to make sure that you get the right offer in front of them at the right time. So let yeah. me ask, let me ask and, you and the, the million dollar question. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so the, I mean that, 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 that's, the, that's the answer everybody wants to know out there. And if you can, if you can deliver that, you can become a millionaire. <laughs> well, uh, the the short answer is uh, is data. Um, the the long answer is you know we've essentially developed this methodology to where we help you understand who your fans are, and then ultimately plug that into some sort of acquisition platform, whether it's email marketing or Facebook, to ultimately result in a sale. Um, the then result is that you end up seeing you know whatever campaign numbers that you want to drive go up without having to be some super intense like data scientist for that matter. So yeah. so so with, well, with, with without without revealing your secret sauce, the secret formula. How, I mean, what 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 sort of data points are you going out there and and looking at? I mean, how you know? Let 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 let's let's pick a let's pick a sample artist here, and just use that as our discussion point. Um, the Rolling Stones. Got it. So the Rolling you know, Stones would be pretty fun, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, and and essentially, like what what we've done is we we've got a, a series of acquisition tools, right? So whether you're giving away, you know, like a free download, which wouldn't necessarily be applicable for the Rolling Stones, or a contest for the chance to win, like you know, a, a Rolling Stones merch bundle. Their team would post it on their Facebook or Twitter page, and then a bunch of fans would see it, get really excited, and enter the contest. Um, now, what's kind of going be going on behind the scenes on our contest landing page is that anyone that enters through this contest, we end up scraping data from the various social networks that they end up syncing. So if they sync up their Facebook page, we end up pulling all of their Facebook page likes, their name, email, demographic information, and so forth. If they sync up their Spotify account, then we know all the artists they're following, all the playlists that they're following, and all the songs they've saved. So let, let me let me ask you a question then. So they come to a contest page, and I'm just trying to follow the process here. When you say sync up, does mm -hmm. that mean they register to enter by using their Facebook profile or their Spotify profile? One 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 of these existing methods that live out there that we all use all the time. They registered by saying, "Use my Facebook ID to register." Yeah, um, so it's it's basically like you you enter with um, something called Facebook OAuth without getting yep, too nerdy yep, about yep. it, um, and then you also in in order to increase your chances of winning or just do some extra actions, you can then sync up Spotify to like support that artist by following their playlist. Okay. Okay. So right. So and let me let me back up just a little bit, Ali. There's what I found that was really interesting from the start is. You know, we've all used these companies that kind of do media buying and they provide some analytics. You know, I love the guys over at Gupta. You know, there's, a, there's other people that do this. And I think what some of, you know, my clients were kind of doing was looking at those and kind of graduated from that to Tone Den because it kind of complements it really well. If you're doing an online ad campaign, 
you're, you can pretty much reach, if you look at it as a target, you can pretty much reach your core group. But the idea is to kind of grow outside of that, that circle. And I think what Tone Den does, and, and it looks like does it very well, is takes that second step to kind of go out and find likely uh, fans. So let's leave Rolling Stones out. Let's take um, a new developing artist. So it's, you know, it's Michael Branvold's new band. Nobody knows about this band. He's got his core group. But then we could go to Tone Den and talk about a little bit how you would, you know, jump off that platform from the core group and find people who are likely going to be fans. Yeah, so, so the idea is that if we know what, what a core fan looks like, we can take whatever that digital, digital and streaming fingerprint is and help you find new fans. Um, so every single social media platform today, whether it's, it's Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, all is something called a, a lookalike generator. And essentially what that means is that if you put in an existing customer list, whether it's through your email, your website, um, or even your own page likes, they then spit out a similar pool of fans that you can then advertise to. Um, now, what we're finding is that the quality of that seed of fans that you put in directly impacts the quality that the social network's gonna gonna spit out in terms of relevant fans for you to target to. So if you're putting in like a, a three or four year old mailing list where the fans might not necessarily be, be up to date, you're not gonna get as good of a look like as say, you know, your most engaged fans from the past yeah. month that Fair enough. also you know follow similar clusters of artists on on Facebook or Spotify for that matter. So if we get that list of, of core fans and provide a, a slight number of extra refinements based off of data that normally you wouldn't have access to, like their Facebook interest data and their Spotify artist data, we're able to essentially map out who those like most likely fans might so, be. And do you find that effective, You know that you find that you are growing those bases using those kinds of tools? Yeah, I, I think as long as you tie it back to some sort of acquisition event, um, you'll, you'll be fine. So like one of the things that, that we're planning on doing, knock on wood, with um, with a band called Bell 1011 is they're they're getting out a free mixtape, and for them, they're all about acquiring new fans. And basically, we're going to have a handful of their core fans download the mixtape, but then based off of that core fan base, we'll then reach out to new fans, offering them this new free mixtape download. Um, so it's kind of like a, a cycle in that sense of, yeah, you might be acquiring emails of your existing fans initially, but then afterwards we can use that data to acquire really similar fans that, that would be interested in your band. What, what, what if the artist doesn't have core fans? So what if an artist comes to you and says, I don't, I don't have an email list, I don't have anything, you know, I'm a brand new artist, I want you to help me find fans that should like me so they become my yeah. core fans. Would you go after like competitive artists? You know, could you do that? So let's say using the Michael, you know, he's this new artist. He doesn't have a fan base yet, but we know that people of this particular artist, you know, could well, you target? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the it's the real basic Facebook targeted advertising model of hey, I am a I am a new band that was influenced by the Rolling Stones. I would think Rolling Stones fans should like me. Therefore, put me in front of Rolling Stones fans, and hopefully a, a small percentage of them will come over. So, I mean, how do you, how do, how do you work in that sense if, if someone comes in and goes, I don't have an email list. I have nothing. I've got 100 people on my Facebook page. Yeah, for, for the smaller guys, it's definitely a little bit challenging. Um, I, I'm not... I mean, it, so we started out in electronic in electronic music, right? So for us, like the way that a lot of dance musicians kind of do it from scratch is they end up putting the first couple of sounds up on SoundCloud, and then they actually get their buddies to repost it on SoundCloud, but then they make right. sure that their their song's a free download and has a toned down download gate. And even if you have, you know, two to three friends give you a, a good cosign on SoundCloud, that's usually enough to get 100 to 1,000 downloads, and you know, maybe anywhere between ten to sixty thousand plays to give you that like minimal minimal idea of what a core fan would look like. Um, so on that, and it kind of boils back down to okay, like let's get a little bit of data in order to to see what happens there. Um, I think when bands are building from scratch, to a, a key component that I, I don't see going away anytime soon is doing some sort of PR campaign. At least if it is represented by like. Or excuse me, at least if the band is represented by some management firm or, or label, they typically dish out some kind of funds for that. So 
giving out something for free during that PR campaign is also enough to then say, okay, if we if we just wait like seven days after the PR campaign, we'll have enough data to then actually make educated decisions if we do want to you know yeah, couple it with an app. And and, and, I'm, and I don't want to put you on the spot here because uh, you know I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 walking through scenarios of. I've worked. I mean, we've all worked with clients who are the small indies, have nothing to the big ones who have the fan base, and and quite quite honestly, the listeners for our show are more likely the new ones. They're like, don't tell me how the Rolling Stones are going to do it. I'm not the Rolling <laughs> Stones, you know. I'm 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 just trying to make it happen here. So, you know, I've had plenty of clients who come in where like, I've got no email list. Um, I've got maybe a hundred people on an email list, something that's, you know, really not significant enough to work with. And and one option in the past has been, all right, well let's let's go let's go gather some emails and start gathering fans of let's give away your music on Noise Trade. Noisetrade.com. Great service. Everybody who downloads it has to put an email address in. You can do a five hundred dollar promotion with Noise Trade. And you can probably walk away with two to three thousand email addresses. How would you, if if I came to you and said, "Well, you know what? Rather than doing that, could I take five hundred dollars with Tone Den and put together a promotion to give away my music?" Would you be able to acquire as many more? I mean, what what you know? Because you know, artists. Even the big artists, and Jay can probably attest to this, you know, f- spending five hundred dollars, that's you know, it better damn well work. Even the richest artists are really tight when it comes to spending money like that, um, even though they've got it. But the smaller, newer artists, that could be their entire marketing campaign right there. So it's really got to work, and I just want to get a feel. Because I understand where you're coming from and how this works, and it and it definitely sounds interesting, you know, for for that new up and coming indie initial exposure. What you know, a five hundred dollar budget. Where can you go with that? So for for the newer guys, the the indie guys, I, w- I would actually recommend spending that five hundred on on PR and just like that general indie music blog circuit. If you truly have like no fans and you're and you're trying to build up at that point, like to me, like that's where if I if I were a music manager, I would allocate like my funds. I would still use a service like Tone Den to to also give out my music for free to make sure that I'm collecting data along the way. But I, I think. It makes sense to begin advertising, like either when you do have some sort of like you know tangible merch line, when it's your like, first official label release and the label is actually chipping in to help you out, or you're actually going out and touring, right? Um, up until then, what you're trying to do really is is build some semblance of a core fan base, and at, at least what I've seen in the electronic space, I mean, none of these kids had had any budget three to four years ago that are now like you know touring glo- globally. Right. If you look at Nightmare, Jaws, and Slander. But what they did have was a ton of music. So yeah. they, they gave out their music for free on a, on a platform like SoundCloud, got followers each time, and then each time they released new music, their distribution platform got larger because it ended up in more people's feeds, more fans reposted it, they had that download get attached, they got more SoundCloud followers, and it worked out for them in that space. Um, in terms of bands that operate outside of SoundCloud, it's I think it's very challenging because Apple and and Spotify, as great services as they are for very developed artists, for the smaller ones, they don't necessarily have that kind of ecosystem in place. It's a lot more political in the sense that you de- do need to know someone in, in editorial at either of those services to get yep. the same amount of exposure that you would on, say, like SoundCloud, asking a handful of friends to repost your music. Well, you bring up a really good point, and that is that you know, with with downloads dropping as fast as they're dropping and people moving to streaming um, Spotify, Apple Music you know, Google Play to a lesser degree, you know Amazon, all these streaming services are becoming more and more important tell us a little bit about your strategy for for the streaming side yeah, so for the streaming side I, I think it all boils down to, to playlisting right, so if you look at like the like where your play- streams on Spotify are coming from, they're either coming from you know a playlist directly, your saves, uh, direct listens, and then a handful of other sources like you being in some random app. 
Um, and I, I think the the largest driver of discovery, whether it is Apple or Spotify, I'll speak about Spotify more because that's what I understand a little bit more. It's it's primarily yeah. streaming on that end. And if you look at the four sources of streaming, the, the largest is Spotify editorial, meaning like the playlist that they curate themselves. Um, the second is through major label subsidiary playlists, like your filters and your dicksters and your top spies. But right. you know, you're not really getting in there unless you are signed with the Sony or Universal. Right. The the third are independent playlisting companies, right? Or and, and that could be like you know D- Digimark or Digin. I keep forgetting their name. Um, Digimark. Where they, yeah. They, Look, we know a bunch of sixteen-year-olds across the world that are going to put put your your song in your playlist. Um, although that's a little bit challenging because Spotify has essentially cracked down and, and really disabled that direct outreach, um, which leaves the fourth option, which is you actually owning your own playlist and seeing your own content in there. And I think what what I'm seeing a lot at at labels and even among managers is everyone's looking for playlists, kind of like how they're looking for blogs to get their artists featured in, but. I think there's a huge like s- supply issue essentially, right? There are a ton of Spotify on playlists that you want to get into, but unless you you know are friendly with Spotify editorial, you're not really going to be able to get in there, um, and which leaves very limited options. So I would actually you know recommend to a lot of artists, even though it seems like a lot of effort, to actually you know pull together some friends and start building your own playlist. Build right? your like, own and drive traffic to your own and yeah. promote your own side of, sort of thing. Yeah. It, 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 it takes a concerted effort. It takes a while, but it's it's also an investment, right? Like a million plays in Spotify, depending on whether or not you own your masters, can get you anywhere between what two to eight thousand dollars. I want to say um, it really depends once again on like what your deal structure is. But I mean, I have friends that are like you know electronic artists that aren't signed to any labels, own all their masters, pulling in a healthy check each month, and they're like, I don't know what people are saying because this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Have you done any campaigns where you know, hey, you you stream this, you get this type thing to, or or, or you you add this to a playlist and you get this. So the, the way that we have our, our downloads and our contesting structured is one of the extra actions that can occur is um, all in one button click, you essentially save the song to your Spotify collection in addition to also following their playlist. And then we have an extra button that says, hey, stream the song. I mean, the reason why I like driving collection ads more so than streams is because, I mean, on, on one end, people really do just like, you know, press, press, press shuffle with their, uh, excuse me, with their safe collection, right? So on that end, if your song's in that pool, like, you know, one out of every maybe 20 songs, your song have played or 40 or whatever they've got it as, um, which is good for you. Um, and then the, the second is if you look at how Spotify's algorithm kind of works, like a Basically, a save is also considered as a, a playlist ad. So whether you're trying to, I, I don't know, I don't know too much about this, but whether or not you're trying to, you know, trigger the Discover Weekly algorithm or just try to hit the viral sure. chart, like you know, all those saves tend to add up over time. You're right. I mean, that's one of the two big metrics that we keep hearing all the time is, you know, on the positive side, if you save a song into one of your playlists, that's a huge thumbs up for their algorithm. And then the other one is if you skip a song on the negative side, that's, you know, that's a, a bad thing. Yeah. So let, let, let me, let, let me, let me okay. ask you. So, um, you know, and I appreciate your, your honesty about if you had $500, go run a PR campaign. Um, what would you say is the ideal threshold then for someone to come to you and say all right i'm ready to work i mean at what size of a fan base should an artist already have to get the most effective use out of tone then maybe like a, th- a thousand to two thousand like facebook fans on that end. and that's not much you know no, my, exactly. my dog has a thousand i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah but can so, your dog uh, sing <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> What I should have said is that um, I, I mean, so we've got our our free tier, which encompasses a, a lot of these like growth tools, right? Like your your contesting tool and your and your free download tool, and then that's what what we start getting into. Then is like you know our, our paid tier, which involves the direct email messaging, the Facebook ads platform, and then a professional services tier, which kind of operates similar to you know like a, a Gupta Media or or even in a slight way like an M Theory would to a certain extent where. You know, we essentially try to run like whatever Facebook ad campaigns that that you're running. So if it's a label, it's handling your record campaigns. If it's a management company, it's actually taking a look at your merch store and seeing how you can properly basically use those funds to to increase sales like in your merch store or or tour campaigning. It it, it really, sorry if if I'm all across the board here. No, 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 it's good. 
every management company I've seen, they all operate differently. Oh, like yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, every every yeah, band sure, every yeah. band is different, every management company, every label. Uh, I mean, that that's the challenge for all three of us. Anybody who's out there working is there's no one package that you can just say, buy this and it'll work. Yeah. I mean, if we had to divide it into, into two areas, I'd say, like, you, you basically got – really developed and established bands that have audiences but aren't effectively reaching all of them. Um, so an example of that might be, um, and we'll use like Rice for an example, right? Rice I think has like a million, close to a million Facebook fans, but then millions of fans that, that stream their music across Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, and so forth. And not everyone that's like an active Thrice fan likes that band on Facebook. So what we're able to do is effectively reach all those fans that don't like thrice on facebook yet meaning they haven't followed their page but are still actively streaming them on other streaming services um so that's kind of like the one the one use case there where it's like okay if we want to get them merch tickets pu push them to spotify push them to itunes or vinyl that's something we can do on the second end you've got these developing acts that might not necessarily have like a, a fully developed audience on that end but are looking to acquire new fans and are either actively spending on pr or trying to push their labels to invest in these kinds of Facebook marketing campaigns. On that end, we look at their core audience and say, okay, based off of these kinds of characteristics, we'll give you the tech and we can either help you do it or you can do it yourself to like plug and chug these advertising campaigns into Facebook that help you acquire emails, page likes, once again, whatever that core metric is for, for that band at that time. So, so let me, I'm still trying to completely understand the entire process here. So I'm coming in, I've got 50,000 Facebook likes, I'm a good size, active artist, I've got music I'm going to give away, I'm going to set up a contest that says, you know, here, I'm, I'm giving away a new EP, whatever it might be. Um, it's run through Tone Den, and then when my fans come in and you scrape their Facebook data, how, what happens at, after that now? How, are, are, are you taking this contest and presenting it out to look-alike fans are so, you are, are, are you are you I'm, how, how do we how is the artist getting exposure to new people beyond their 50,000 so let's say that um so typically like there's a lot of things going on during a marketing campaign right like it's it's not just them like running a contest or a giveaway typically there's some sort of like you know formal like album or EP release afterwards um, and what we essentially do is say, okay, phase one, data collection. After we have that data, let's look at what's happening in phase two. And typically, you know, let's say it's an indie artist that has like a deal with a distributor like InGrooves. The, the sales team or, or the label services team over at InGrooves is going to make sure that that specific artist ends up getting featured in, you know, Spotify editorial, Apple editorial, or maybe they have friends that, that work at those services and get them hooked up in those playlists, right? All of a sudden, their monthly listener account jumps from, you know, 100,000 fans to like 350,000 to 500,000 monthly listeners. While they're kind of kind of like hot and, and coming out with that new, new album, we then say, okay, let's run an advertising campaign to push people either back to like your page, back to your store to go ahead and buy your album on iTunes or, or vinyl, um, run a merch campaign, whatever you're trying to do at that moment. Um, what I've found is that if you are advertising and you're, you're an organic band, there still is a healthy market for vinyl. Fans are really open to supporting you and buying like physical things, um, which is nice because if you are going to throw in like you know so even something as low as like 250 bucks on a campaign, you'd rather point someone back to like a 12 dollar <laughs> purchase than like a you know point zero 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 like one cent stream for that matter. Um, so on that end, basically we're what we've done is we've actually created this technology that creates ads and puts them into Facebook for you. So you're no longer looking at ads manager that looks like a spaceship. You're creating the ad in Toned In. We're creating all the audiences for you based off of the data that you've collected through your contest. And then you literally watch it from start to finish while we optimize everything okay, for you. Okay, so, so, so then, correct me if I'm wrong then. So the the artist comes in drives their Facebook fans to come to this Tone Den landing page. You're scraping all this data from their Facebook profiles of who else they like, what they do. I mean, Facebook has depths of data on all of us. And then the process to get that exposed to more people is you're, you're going to work with that artist to create 
targeted Facebook campaigns to put this promotion in front of people that should be interested. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and the the way that that would normally work is like you know normally as an artist who's who may or may not have ever run an advertising campaign before, you're logging into Facebook, creating an ads manager account, and looking at this really intimidating thing that was built for like a VP of marketing at Coca Cola. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. And, and on that end, you're. Yeah, what I've noticed is that like it's just it's very intimidating at at first, and then even then, like Facebook's targeting options are so robust because it's designed for any kind of digital marketer in in any industry that oftentimes you just get lost or you get overwhelmed and end up picking too many well, things. Well, yeah, the, the yeah. and the and the and the problem is, you as the artist doing this on your own would have to sit down and go, well, let me see. Who should my fans be liking? You don't have the data. You're you're just guessing. Well, you know, I'm a Rolling Stones influenced band. Okay, my fans, you know, the fans of Rolling Stones and Keith Richards and Mick Jagger, they should like me. So I'm just going to throw those in there, and that's my target. When that target is so freaking huge, you're never going to be seen by anybody that matters. Or to Jay's point, you completely missed it because your fans actually are more into Aerosmith than Rolling Stones. But what you're able to do is you're actually pulling that data when they come in to register on that promotion, and you will know exactly who those targets should be. Exactly. Um, and in defense of the artist, even digital marketers in, in other industries that you know, do have these fancy titles like you know, VP of Marketing, they still like you know the artist's level of intelligence for for Facebook advertising and their aptitude for it might be the same as that VP of marketing. At oh, it's just, it's just it's just throwing Fair stuff. Enough. It's just throwing stuff against the wall. If if well, yeah, if, if, like you don't, if you don't if you don't have experience or data, right? you know, you know the old joke in advertising is you know half my advertising doesn't work. I just don't know which half, you know, and it's they're throwing things to the wall to see what sticks. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're just hoping to make the best guess. And quite often, that best guess in what I've seen ex- through experience is way too broad. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 you know. Side note: I once had a client who was doing some targeted advertising, and they were uh, uh, a hard rock band, and their target was anybody who likes guitars. And I was just well, like, that narrows it down. Hey, I, okay, but that guitar player might not be a hard rock guitar player it could be a spanish guitar that person is not going to like you and you just wasted your money putting your ad in front of them so you know yeah a lot a, a lot of people think in that terms oh i'm just going to say facebook show this to everybody who likes music <laughs> and- ali it sounds like you do some things like like a media buyer does say like a, a gupta do you ever work kind of in conjunction with a media buyer because it seems like some of the core services that you have aren't necessarily overlapping. Um, I mean, I sometimes you work in conjunction with the media buyer. I think for us, um, we're trying to bring all of this stuff in house. Like our, I think our whole MO here is that the stuff that these these media buyers do and charge a, a substantial portion of your budget for are things that, as a digital marketer, you can you can basically handle right, which is why sure. algorithmically, if you have the time and the you know, yeah. I mean, would you handle SEO? Would you handle you know? I, obviously, you're doing some things with Facebook, but would you do some YouTube pre roll? You know, would you do other? Could you handle those kinds of things In- as well? Instagram, yeah. Twitter, you know, other networks. Yeah, yeah, we um, we, we can. Um, and the cool thing is that like. Basically, I mean, we're pretty gung ho on Facebook just because, in a, in a broader sense, they've got the most mature—not most mature ad platform in the world. But right now, like, so much money is being poured into Facebook advertising compared to Twitter and Google that they're really just on top of their game. If you actually wanted to build, like, well, they a product. also have, they, they. I mean, I, I don't know if this is for sure, yeah. but I would say they've got more data on every person on this planet than anybody else does. Except for maybe Google, yeah. Yeah, it's a but, close. Well, Google, you know, I don't know. I might say they may even have more than Google. Google kind of knows what you search for, and maybe what websites you go to. But Facebook knows a lot more about you if you're a Facebook user and you're active in the Facebook environment. 
which yeah, like, I think yeah, they that's, both that's know be, a lot. I that's mean, be they both real. know that's a lot your of gender. They both know where you live. They both know your likes and dislikes, and you know, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they both know a lot of information. But I hear what you're saying. You know, on, you know, yeah, I search, you know, for the things that I like. But uh, on Facebook, you know, they it's all. You know, all my vacation photos, all my movies that I've liked, every book that I've liked and read and posted about. There's, I, I can't even imagine the kind of information that Facebook has under the hood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess one more note for you guys, because I, I know there are a, a lot of independent artists listening on the show. Um, I, I think a big thing for us, like, really trying to push Facebook on on artists, and, and I know that the relationship with Facebook's kind of been shaking in the past, but... The reason why is because I see a ton of other industries, whether it's mobile gaming or e-commerce, actually driving profitable advertisements on Facebook. Um, and the reason why is because they just have the data and the tools necessary to do so. Um, but then I look at a handful of independent artists, and I actually see that, like, you know, I have friends like Dak Daniels, for instance. He's like a, a dubstep artist, and as ridiculous as like that, like stage name might seem at face value, this kid was a former professional skateboarder for for Baker, and he's making thousands of dollars a month selling like these rings at skate shops at pop-up shops right or he's selling like you know skateboard like hybrid merch like through his artist profile and he's making more sales in physical than he is online so what i'm doing right now is basically saying look like let's also develop an, an online channel for you based off of the the data that you've gathered from all of your free downloads and so forth um so for him it's like I think that a lot of artists do have these large business opportunities sitting in front of them, especially if they can move like merch or if they know that like they do have the fan base. It's just a challenge of saying like, okay, you know, if we did want to dump in like five hundred to a thousand dollars a month, how do we do so without losing that money forever? Because that's really, really important to you when when you're operating on a lean budget. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, where yeah. do, where do people find, find you online? Where can we get more information on you? Where do you sign up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a uh, tone den dot I O T O N E D E N uh, dot I O the dot I O is a, you know, it was just one of the few domains that was available. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's really what, what a lot of naming boils down to with internet. Stuff. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and when somebody signs up, how, um, are, are, are you there to sort of help people get things set up? Will you respond to questions? Will you help guide best practices? Yeah, so if someone signs up, uh, they'll get a welcome email from me asking to grab a beer in Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, so on that end, if you, if you do have questions, like, we'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, we, we basically have multiple like, opportunity points for you to submit a question for the site. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I I, well, I mean this this, this really this, interesting man. Yeah, this this intrigues me a lot because I'm always I'm always interested in in new ways to acquire fans especially when it's data driven. Um because yeah, I'm a big believer in, you know, numbers don't lie, data doesn't lie, you know. That's it's not a guarantee, but it's it's much more likely to be successful if it's data driven than just your gut throwing something against the wall thinking, I think this is what they're going to like. And um, so, no, this, this interests me a lot. I, I, I can, I can tell everybody right now, I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go, go give it a shot and see if I've got a client that has something that um, would work for this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think yeah. our goal once again is like, I mean, there's been so much talk about data for the past, I don't know, at least five years, that's how long like I've been observing the music industry, which isn't very long, but um, I, you know, we, I don't think we wanted to be another company that's just presenting another dashboard, right? Because like, you can be like inundated with large amounts of data, but then not know what to do with it. So for us, we're, we're really just trying to solve the second half of the equation, which is like, okay, you know data's important, you've got a lot of it, how do we actually turn it into money? Um, so that, yeah. that, that's the goal. And it really sounds like your strength is kind of building on that second phase of, okay, how do we grow the fan base? We know who our core is. How do we grow that? And I think that's the biggest challenge for a lot of the artists that we work with. So uh, thanks for your time, Allie. It's super interesting, and, and I'll be seeing you soon. Yeah, see you soon, Jay. Thank, thanks, thank, Mike. Thank really you so much. You thank you. All right, man. Take care. Take care. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, yeah. You know... A few years ago, I was working with a startup that was 
doing something interesting with data not quite like this but they were they were scraping like twitter because ba- years ago years ago like five years ago when you did a twitter search you the results were not based on a hundred percent of the twitter data twitter only get you know kind of cut that funnel down and only gave you some of the data but what they were doing is they had access to the entire Twitter stream because back then you ha- as a company you had to pay for access to get to that Twitter pipeline and for musicians what they were doing is running searches on the entire pipeline of tweets everything and searching for now playing which is the common hashtag that is used in tweets and your artist name and they would return to you everybody as an artist you could see every user on Twitter who had sent out a tweet saying now playing which that's pretty valuable now the 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 startup never was able to get much further than that but I was like you know if you can develop this I like the way they're thinking using data using the data really brings it out and and what these guys are doing is the same thing it's like all right well we're using the facebook data th- that comes along with every one of us when we travel around the internet and log in using our facebook profile to a website yeah. we've got data now as to well who are the other artists that jay likes at the yeah. simplest the simplest level who are the other artists jay likes yeah. great so then if jay likes those artists and he likes this one that we're running the campaign on we should go put this campaign in front of these fans who like these other artists right and you could take it a step further because now you know that jay's in this market and we're going to be on tour yep, you can and bring it down to market size and, and, and demographics yeah, yeah I, I you know at the at the simplest level i was just saying this artist to this artist a look-alike fan but you're right i mean this is where the data gets really valuable as you start intermixing um multiple artists they like this they like this they like this they live in this they live in this region they're of you know maybe you don't want to put it in front of people who don't have income you know i i only want people who have a certain amount of income facebook knows that about us Mm -hmm. scary they do know all of this about us see i'm one of those people that loves the fact that they have the data and I know I'm the minority but I love it when an ad is delivered to me and it's proper it's something I that I'm interested agree. in and you know I don't want to see you know ads for things that aren't relevant to me so I don't mind giving that information I really don't and and I just love the way that I'll be looking at a site you know maybe it's a uh, you know uh, photography equipment and then I'll go visit you know some other site and a, a little ad pops up or something that I just browsed you know either on Facebook or Amazon or something I happen to like that stuff but getting back to to tone den I'm I'm going to uh, be meeting with uh, Ali uh, with one of my clients here in the next week or so and hopefully we can uh, run a campaign and I can come back and report on you know, how did it do? You know, how, you know, did we grow our fan base? You know, was it successful? Um, I have a feeling based on what I've seen so far that it probably will be. Yeah, and, 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 and if nothing else, the fact that they are running targeted Facebook ad campaigns based on this data is a big plus. Because trust me, one of the things I do for a lot of my clients is run Facebook ad campaigns for them. Me too. Yeah, and, um, and it can be daunting. It, it's very difficult to do. I mean, I know the steps aren't that difficult, but what's difficult is finding that right target. That target, ex- exactly, because you want to hit the right. That's what it's all about is hitting that right target, right? And there's so many options. You're like a kid in a candy store. You can hit a demo, a gender, a geo. You can hit so many things, but that you alluded to this earlier, it dilutes your spend. You want to hit the right people, and I yeah. think that's where tone dense and, and, uh, and, strength and, and, is. And, and just so everyone understands why that target is so important is because data will give you – in, if you're running a campaign to get more likes, more fans, Facebook is going to tell you how many impressions that ad got, how many likes that ad got, and how much you spent in total, and how much it cost per like. 
it might sit here and go, it costs you 79 cents per like. Well, the, the difference between a good target and a bad target is you might change the target for that same ad, exact same visual, message, everything else, but the target is not this band, but this band, and that cost per like could drop down to 30 cents. Now, which is huge. Which is a yeah. huge difference. Huge difference. I had a, I had a client that that um, in the past ran a campaign which was not very targeted, and they were spending a dollar fifty per like. And I came in and took it over, and I brought that down to like twenty one cents per like. Nice. You know. So think of and in the simplest terms of, okay, that dollar fifty in the past got them one like. Now that dollar fifty gets you how many likes? Because you keep driving that cost yeah. per acquisition down. That's why the target is so important. And changing one target parameter could be all it takes to make that successful. Yeah. So good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Good catching up. I love stuff like this. All right. You guys got questions? Leave them. Leave them in our comments on YouTube. Hit us up on Twitter. Facebook, wherever. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely.